Hello, B here, and welcome back to biology. Today, we are going to be learning about the fungi kingdom. Can you think of any examples of fungi? Maybe some that you eat? Mushrooms might have come to mind, but what else? Mmm, I just love the smell of fresh bread baking. It makes me so hungry. But wait, isn't bread made from wheat? which is a plant? And I just told you we are learning about fungi today, not plants. Well, it turns out that there is a fungus involved in baking bread as well. If you've ever baked bread from scratch, you may be familiar with the ingredient that is necessary to make the bread rise and be fluffy, yeast. And yeast is, you guessed it, a fungus. We'll learn more about yeast and other types of fungi in today's lesson. But before we get started, let's look at our goals for this lesson. By the end, you'll be able to describe common characteristics and behaviors of fungi, compare and give examples of the five different phyla of fungi, explain how fungi are useful to humans. Let's start with some basics about fungi. They are made of eukaryotic cells, just like you and me. And most species of fungi are multicellular. What about how they get food and nutrients? Do you think they are autotrophs like plants or heterotrophs like animals? Fungi are often mistaken for plants since so many of them grow out of the ground. But in this case, they are more like animals. Fungi are heterotrophs which means they must eat in order to obtain organic nutrients. They cannot do photosynthesis like plants. Although I've never seen a mouth on a fungus, so how do they get their meals? Most fungi are decomposers, meaning they break down dead decaying matter and recycle the nutrients contained in it. They share this role with many species of bacteria and protists, especially the slime molds, which remember were our fungus-like protists. Others are parasites and actively steal nutrients from other living things, often plants. Many fungi absorb nutrients from their surroundings by means of many long hyphae, which are thread-like structures that reach out into the surrounding soil. A massive hyphae from a single fungus organism or a closely interacting colony of organisms is known as a mycelium. The mycelium is usually under the soil where you can't see it. The mycelium of this Amaryllia osteae, commonly known as honey mushrooms, can reach up to a mile long and span entire sections of forest. Notice how the mushrooms grow right up onto the tree trunk, an indication that this is also a parasitic species and is draining nutrients from the growing tree. We said earlier that fungal cells are eukaryotic, but they still have a characteristic structure that can easily identify them from the cells of plants and animals. Let's take a close-up look at some fungal cells under the microscope. Since we've already established that yeast is a fungus, we'll start with them. At a low magnification, these yeast cells just look like little circles. Fun fact, instead of saying yeast when you're baking, you can call these little creatures Saccharomyces cerevisiae. If we were to zoom in closer with an electron microscope, we could see the structure of each cell a little more clearly. Notice that they tend to be football shaped and many appear to be sprouting something. We'll talk more about these little buds in a few minutes, but this elongated shape is a typical trait of fungal cells. Another defining characteristic of fungi is their cell walls. Remember that animal cells don't have rigid cell walls, only the flexible cell membrane. 
Plant cells do have cell walls like fungi, but the cell walls of these two kingdoms are made of very different materials. We'll learn more about plant cells in the next lesson, but for now, know that fungal cells always have a layer of chitin in addition to the lipid bilayer and membrane proteins. Chitin is a polysaccharide that also contains an amino group. Remember that polysaccharides are large sugar molecules, and amino groups contain nitrogen, like the amino acids that make up protein. Do you see the amino groups in this chitin molecule? There they are! If you've ever seen a large colony of mushrooms growing in a forest or field such as this one, you may have guessed that fungi are quite good at reproducing and spreading out. Most fungi, including mushrooms, are capable of reproducing both sexually and asexually. Remember that sexual reproduction requires two parents and has the advantage of being able to easily create genetic diversity by generating new combinations of alleles from the parents. Asexual reproduction usually involves an organism simply making an identical copy of itself. It's harder to introduce diversity and variation this way, which are potential adaptations, but it is quick and requires far fewer resources from the organism. Fungi are able to make use of both modes, depending on the conditions they find themselves in. To reproduce asexually, most fungi will undergo the process of budding. A parent cell will grow a bud on one end of the cell, containing its own nucleus and organelles, and then the bud will eventually break off and begin multiplying to form a new organism. Most fungi are capable of producing haploid spores, which are similar to plant seeds. Releasing the spores is the main job of the fruiting body of fungi. For fungi such as mushrooms, much of the day-to-day -day processes that keep the organism alive go on underground, in the mycelium. The mushroom itself is simply the fruiting body that will release the spores when the time comes. Sometimes the release of spores from the mushroom is visible if you are watching at just the right moment. Many of these spores can grow into mature organisms without needing to be fertilized. When conditions are ideal and there's plenty of water and nutrients available, this is the preferred method of reproduction for fungi. After all, they might as well take advantage of ideal growing conditions as quickly as possible. When conditions are not as ideal and there is little motivation for the organism to reproduce quickly, the scale tips in favor of sexual reproduction. Spores from two different fungi can fuse to create a diploid organism that has a combination of traits from both parents. So which fungus is the mom and which is the dad in this case? Well, it's not that simple, because the fusion of gametes does not follow the pattern seen in animals or even plants. It is impossible to draw such a distinction. So fungi are not assigned sexes of male and female. However, spores must still fuse with a compatible mating type, and in most fungi species, the mating types are simply listed as positive and negative. A positive spore would only be able to fuse with a negative spore. Some species of fungi even have more than two mating types, but spores will still have to find a type that it is compatible with for fusion to take place. The fungi kingdom is generally divided into five phyla. Let's take a quick look at each one. Phylum Ascomycota contains yeast, as well as species of cup fungi and morel mushrooms. If you've ever suffered from athlete's foot, a condition which makes the skin on your feet peel and itch, you can thank the Ascomycete trichophyton rubrum. The Basidiomycota phylum contains most species of mushrooms you are familiar with, such as the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria. Many other species of edible mushrooms, such as Agaricus bisporus or button mushrooms, also belong to this phylum. 
In the zygomycota phylum, we find rhizoplus stolonifer, which you simply know as bread mold. While the desire to not waste food is a noble quest, eating rhizopus can be dangerous, especially if your immune system is already compromised due to illness or other health conditions. Probably best to just toss this one in the trash. Sorry. The phyla Deuteromycota and Chytridiomycota contain other less familiar species of fungi, such as the amphibian chytrid fungus, which has decimated many amphibian populations in recent years. This fungal pathogen damages the skin of salamanders and frogs, causing them to be unable to maintain a healthy balance of water and salt. One obvious way in which humans use fungi is as a food source. Mushrooms are often eaten as toppings on burgers and steaks, and we saw at the beginning of this video that yeast cells are useful in baking bread. How does the addition of yeast make bread so soft and fluffy? The yeast cells are alive when they are added to the dough, and as they metabolize the sugars in the dough, carbon dioxide is released. Remember your lesson on fermentation all those units ago? The yeast cells are simply doing fermentation. All of those carbon dioxide bubbles being released into the dough creates tiny pockets of gas, causing the dough to expand, which we see as rising. If the bread gets baked while in this state, it will have a soft, fluffy texture. Another important use of fungus is found in our ability to kill bacteria and cure disease. In 1928, Alexander Fleming was unsuccessfully experimenting with ways to kill bacteria in his petri dishes. As the story goes, he left his lab in frustration on a Friday evening without cleaning up the agar plates. By Monday morning, several colonies of penicillium mold were growing on the plates. Guess what was not growing in the moldy spots? The bacteria! The mold had killed it! From there, we learned how to isolate the chemical being produced by the mold that kills bacteria, and this discovery led to our modern antibiotics. Other fungi species are used to produce medicinal steroids and artificial human hormones. As we went through the lesson today, we saw examples of how fungi obtain nutrients and reproduce. We also looked at the five phyla of mushrooms and how fungi species can benefit humans. As the multicellular kingdom we are probably least familiar with, these organisms can seem strange and mysterious. And sure enough, even scientists don't yet fully understand all of their structures and behaviors. Next time, we'll begin our study of the next eukaryotic kingdom, plants. Until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. Hey, hey.